Hello from the East Coast to the West Coast and to listeners around the world. Welcome to the Truth Seekers Radio Show. I'm your host, Angeline Marie. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. We're broadcasting on Liberty Works Radio Network at libertyworksradionetwork.com and their affiliate stations. Also, don't forget, you can always learn more about our program and find podcasts posted at truthseekersradioshow.com. Today, my guest is Rob Skiba. He's an award-winning documentary filmmaker and the best-selling author of several books, including Babylon Rising and The First Shall Be Last and Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim. As an ancient Nephilim theorist, Rob brings a unique and often unheard perspective to the UFO alien discussion. As such, he has become an internationally recognized public speaker on these subjects, often appearing on paranormal and prophecy talk shows as a featured keynote speaker at conferences all over the world. Rob also has a radio program called Revolutionary Radio on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. And today I'm going to talk to him about something a little bit more off the beaten path. For the last year, I know he has been looking into a subject that has become a little taboo and a lot more people are getting interested in it as of late. So if you will help me welcome Rob Ski. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for talking with me today. It was about a year ago, well, not quite a year ago, I heard a radio broadcast. You had taken a hiatus from your show, and this was the show where you came back to talk about and tell your listeners why you had been gone. So I know you you've told the story a million times over, but for those listeners who don't know your story, I was wondering if you could tell us from that day what happened to you and what is this unbelievable thing I'm talking about, just to start things off. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, yeah, as you read in my bio there, most of my research is centered around the subject of the Nephilim and UFOs and aliens and that sort of thing from a biblical worldview, as well as government conspiracies and things of that nature. That's what my first two books were about. Um, but then, well, it was about this time last year, I was doing my taxes, and uh, I, I had to drive down to uh, see my accountant. It's about an hour and a half drive from where I live. And I like to listen to other people's podcasts and stuff, and especially if I'm on a long drive, I'll, I'll find something you know that I can listen to to keep me occupied on the drive. So uh, one of my go-to places is Canary Cry Radio, and my friends Basil and Gons uh, host the show. And they had this guy on named Mark Sargent, and the topic was flatter. So uh, like everybody, when you first hear that, you think, what? You know, that's just absurd. I mean, what is this? So I, I thought maybe, you know, because they're kind of goofy guys, so I figured, you know, this must be an April Fool's gag or something, you know, because it was a pre-recorded show. They had already had it released, but before I had time to check it out. And so I listened to the show, and I went into it just like anybody else would, rolling my eyes, thinking this is just ridiculous. But by the end of the hour and a half long interview, uh, my world was shaken up, to put it mildly. So I did my taxes with my accountant. And then I had an hour and a half drive back home. So I listened to it a second time. And I was like, this is just, come on, really? Seriously? Now, meanwhile, before I had listened to that, there were a number of people. I've maxed out on my friends list on Facebook, you know, the personal profile. You're allowed 5,000. And I had maxed out a long time ago. And I get stuff from people all the time. And I don't really have time to check it all out. Uh, But a a large number of those quote-unquote friends were sending me things related to Flat Earth to check out. And I just deleted their, you know, paid no attention to it. Um, But after I listened to the Mark Sargent interview, I began to realize why Basil and Gods even had the guy on in the first place. Because people were starting to look into this. And Mark Sargent had put out a series of videos, I believe he had 11 videos out at that time, called Flat Earth Clues. So as soon as I got home, my first thought was, okay, I'm going to watch these Flat Earth Clues for myself. And I did. And then I thought, well, I'm going to debunk this. So I started looking into the claims made in the Flat Earth. And at the same time, I thought, you know, I'd like to interview this guy myself. So I, I want to say it was the 13th of April, 2015, that I listened to the interview with uh, Canary Cry and Mark Sargent. It was two days later. Uh, on April 15th, that I had Mark Sargent on my radio show. And if you go back and listen to that episode, I'm, I was still very much in the Neil Adams expanding Earth, globe Earth camp. And I had done some research uh, in 2014 called the Yahuwah Triangle. And in, in the first part of that 
series, I was dealing with the Great Pyramid of Giza. And I was in the second part, I was dealing with the Garden of Eden. And, and in both cases, I was using the globe uh, as a foundation for a lot of that research. So I, when I'm interviewing Mark, I'm like, look, I'm still very much an expanding Earth globe guy, but I'm intrigued by what you're saying. So tell me more. And he did. And then I got off the air with him, and one of the things he had challenged me, I don't remember if he did it on the air or off the air, but he said, okay, you say you believe in the globe. Great. Prove it without using NASA, the government, or the military. And I had already done an, an expanded edition of my first book, Babylon Rising, and in the expanded edition of the book, I had written probably 50 pages or so showing how NASA is a thoroughly occult organization uh, with its founding going back to Project Paperclip and Nazis and Freemasons and you know, most of the astronauts were Freemasons and, you know, all, they're naming their missions after the pagan gods, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, etc. So I'd already been really questioning NASA for quite some time. And, of course, a fair amount of my first book was dealing with government conspiracy, so I didn't trust the government. And, of course, the military takes its marching orders from the government. So those really are not credible sources for truth, NASA, the military, and the government. But that's where most of us have our understanding of the globe from, if we're honest with ourselves. And so it became really challenging. And as, you know, like everybody else, I'm, I'm thinking, well, we've seen the pictures. In fact, I used to have a, a wallpaper in, the, uh, in my bedroom. It was the whole wall was the surface of the moon looking at the Earth. And it was the famous Earth picture we've all seen from the Apollo 17 mission, allegedly, uh, that's in all the textbooks, showing primarily the continent of Africa, a little bit of Antarctica, and this sort of Nike swoosh-looking cloud formation just kind of off to the side of Africa. Famous picture we've all seen. It. Grew up with that. Well, when I started looking into NASA and the various pictures, you keep seeing words like composite and CGI and things of that nature all the blue marbles that we've seen. In fact, if you've had an iPad or an iPhone since uh, I think it was 2002, the uh, background that used to be the default background on, on the device was of the blue marble from, I believe, 2002. And that's a composite image. In fact, I, I'm a Photoshop expert. When I started looking at that high-resolution image in Photoshop, I could clearly see where the artist was using the Photoshop clone tool to replicate clouds. It's a false image. It's fake. And the subsequent blue marbles aren't any better. And then they released a, a new one last year, a new blue marble, and if you take that image and flip it upside down, the clouds and on one side of it spell out the word sex. So they're, they're, they're taking the same cue as uh, Disney. If you've looked into all the phallic symbols and stuff that Disney has in a lot of their imagery. So I'm going, and, and then I found an image of the Earth. Allegedly, I was on the Jet Propulsion Laboratory website, JPL's website, showing the Earth from, I believe it was 1990, doing a complete uh, rotation, 25-hour rotation. Well, if you watch that video, 25 hours, the, the Earth is supposedly, it's time-lapse of the Earth spinning. None of the clouds are moving. I'm like, wait a minute, I could take my camera outside right now and video tape the sky for an hour and do a time lapse out of that, and you're going to see the clouds doing all kinds of stuff. So here we've got 25 hours. This is an official Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, image, supposedly from the Galileo space probe, showing the Earth in complete rotation in, on December 11, 1990, and no clouds are moving. So now I'm like, what? man, this is just jacking me up here because, it's, you know, all this stuff I thought I knew and thought I understood, and I wanted to be an astronaut. My whole life, that was my goal, was to be an astronaut. Well, I mean, the more I looked into the images that we have from NASA, allegedly of our world, it's clearly fake. CGI, composite image, animations, it's not real. So then I thought, well, okay, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, so I'm going to go back to the Scriptures. Now, of course, we've all used Isaiah 40, 22, uh, you know, the, the circle of the earth argument. Well, it says circle. It doesn't say globe or sphere. And a lot of people, and myself included, when I first used that scripture, used to say, well, you know, it, it's, it, it represents, you know, um, a sphere. But when you realize that Isaiah, the same guy who wrote Isaiah 40.22 in 22.18, used the word ball. So in fact, he's the only other guy in scripture who used the word for a spherical object. So the 
clearly Isaiah knew the difference between a ball and a circle. The Hebrew word he used for ball is dur, and the Hebrew word he used for circle is chug, or chug, depending on how you pronounce it. So he clearly understood the difference. The King James translators clearly understood the difference, because they translated appropriately in Isaiah 22, 18, ball, and in Isaiah 40, 22, circle. And, and he's not the only one writing about the earth in terms of circle. Uh, Proverbs does the same thing. And Proverbs 8.27 says that the circle was inscribed. And the Hebrew word used for ins- the English word tr- inscribed is uh, kalkak or chakak or something like that. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. But basically, it means to carve into something, like chisel like, into stone, like the Ten Commandments. But you can't, you can't chisel a ball into something. But you can chisel a circle into something. So the more I looked through the scriptures, the more I found in no uncertain terms, none, unquestionably, the Bible is a flat earth book from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, I started writing profusely. If you go to my website, testingtheglobe.com, that's where the majority of my brain dump ended up. Uh, First, I was blogging on another uh, site that I had, and that blog was getting longer and longer and longer. I thought, I just got to dedicate a whole website to this topic. So I found the domain testingtheglobe.com was available, because uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm testing what what we've been told. Scripture says to prove all things or test all things, hold fast what is good. So that's what I'm doing. I'm testing what I thought I know, what I think I know. Um, and the more I test it, the more I'm questioning what we have all been taught. So maybe mm-hmm. that's a good place to <laughs> okay, Rob, let's go ahead and take our first break. Listeners, today my guest is Rob Skiba. He's an award-winning documentary filmmaker and best-selling author and radio talk show host. And we'll be back momentarily on the Truth Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the Truth Seekers radio show. Today, my guest is Rob Skiba, and we are discussing Flat Earth, and what does the Bible have to say about that? Rob, are there any other scriptures that come to mind or stand out to you during your research? Oh, gosh, yes. (laughs) Uh, In fact, your listeners, they want to go check it out. Uh, I wrote a blog called um, The Bible and the Still Flat Earth. And it's sort of a two-part deal. The first part is allowing the Bible to speak for itself. You can go to testingtheglobe.com forward slash Bible dot HTML. So if you go to that page, in the first part of it, I just said, okay, let's just take all our preconceived biases and put them aside. Because we all approach, I don't care what the text is, whether it's the Bible or anything else, we all have our preconceived notions and things that we think we understand and know to be true. Um, and so we bring bias to the text. And so the challenge is, okay, we've all seen the globe in our classroom since kindergarten. It's been in our face our entire life. I'll be 47 in June. So, you know, my whole life I've seen this image, just like you have and everybody else has, of the globe. It's burned into our mind. We think it's an established truth. And we bring what we think is an established truth to our reading of the Scripture which we, if you're a born-again Christian who believes the Bible is, uh, is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit written by men, we claim that as our source for truth. Well, the problem is we've got conflicting, quote-unquote, truths here. So it, it, my challenge is, okay, let's put our preconceived biases aside and just let the text speak for itself. So that's what I did. I put a whole bunch of scriptures there, and I divided it up into sections. I had scriptures concerning the nature of the heavens and the sky, and their relationship to the earth, you know, the sky above us, and then scriptures dealing with the nature of the earth below the firmament, and then scriptures concerning the nature of the sun, moon, and stars. And if you just read those, and there's a lot of them there, and I don't claim that this is an exhaustive list, it's just as many as I could think of off the top of my head uh, as I was looking into it, but there's a lot here. And what really tripped me up is I... Um, grew up with the teachings of Dr. Kent Hovind and Carl Baugh and others uh, who t- taught creation science. And 
Carl Baugh and Ken Hoven in particular are fond of talking about the so-called canopy theory. And that is the idea of the firmament was a, a canopy of ice that surrounded the Earth prior to Noah's flood. And that that got broken up during the t- at the start of the flood, and then it rained down for 40 days and 40 nights. It's a convenient and very interesting theory. I have held to it for most of my life. In fact, I've taught it myself, uh, using their material as well as, well as uh, material that I came up with on my own as a result of my research. Um, and you can look at examples like Europa, uh, one of the moons, I think it's of uh, Jupiter, um, in our own solar system that appears to be an example of a, of a planet-like structure that has a canopy of ice surrounding it, uh, and volcanoes supposedly underneath it. So it's an, it's an interesting idea until you go back with taking your preconceived biases and putting them aside and just let the text read read it for yourself. I saw something I never saw before, and that's when he's the, the, Moses is describing the creation of the firmament um, and how it shows up. And then later it describes the sun, moon, and stars being placed in the firmament. That's in Genesis 1, 14 through 18. Uh, it says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, not outside it. And the canopy theory taught by Dr. Kent Hoven and Carl Baugh and others requires the sun, moon, and stars to be outside of it because we're coming to the text of the preconceived Copernican model in mind of a heliocentric spinning ball, you know, uh, in, in a solar system. Uh, but the text doesn't say that. It's And, and I looked it up in Hebrew, too. And uh, Berakia, if I'm pronouncing it right, the letter bait precedes the word rakia for firmament. And when the letter bait is used as the prefix, it means in. You can't use it for outside and around. It means in. In fact, it's the very first letter of our Bible. It, when it says in the beginning, it's bereshit. In beginning. Rashit, beginning. Bereshit, in the beginning. So it, this is saying in the rakia. <laughs> and there's no way around it. In fact, it says it three times in those 14 through uh, 18, those, those verses 14 through 18. So I'm going, wait a minute, this is telling me that there's water that separated, wa- this firmament separated the waters above from the waters below, and then the sun, moon, and stars were put inside the same firmament within which the dry land appeared. So if you just let the text speak for itself and don't bring any preconceived notions to it, you end up with a snow globe. And frankly, there's no way around it. Um, and then the more I looked into it and looked into the entire ancient Near East and what everybody, including the Hebrews, believed, they all believed in the snow globe model. Now, we call it a snow globe because of our modern understanding. You know, we can look at a snow globe and picture it, uh, a circular world enclosed inside of a dome. Never in Scripture do you, or in the ancient text do you see the word snow globe, <laughs> you know. Um, but you kick it around the fact that that's how the entire ancient Near East, including the Holy Spirit-inspired Hebrews, viewed it, viewed it. And, you know, there are a number of scholars out there who are being intellectually honest with the text and saying, yeah, this is what they believe. In fact, Logos Bible Software is one of the more expensive, it's quite expensive, premier Bible software study tools that you can get out there in the market. Logos Bible Software has an image showing the ancient Hebrew cosmology, and they depict it like a snow globe. So there, here are these uh, Semitic language, ancient Near East scholars, experts, saying this is what they all believed. Now, these same guys will turn around and say, of course, they didn't have a quote-unquote scientific worldview, so we don't believe that today, you know, and they write the whole, they'll give a great exegesis on the whole thing. Say, this is what the Bible says, absolutely. It's a still flat, circular earth set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. That's what the Bible says. And then they follow this great teaching with the word but, which basically invalidates everything they just said before that. But we know that's not the case. So, And what they do in the following explanation is basically nullify divine inspiration and they toss out the whole idea of inerrancy, that the Bible is inerrant. Because clearly it's in error. If the spinning heliocentric model of a ball is true, then the Bible is not inerrant. It's full of errors. And if the Hebrew scholars, or the Hebrew authors, um, are divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, like we all have been taught that they were, you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, then 
there's a big problem because the creator of the cosmos clearly doesn't know how to describe his own creation to his people. Or his people didn't like what he had to say, and they changed it. Either way, you got a big, huge mess. So what, what my problem is, is I spent my entire life, I've been a Christian since I was age seven, grew up in the church, been in ministry my entire life. Have bent my, I have spent my entire ministry saying the Bible is true, and we can take it literally. And I believe it's divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that it is without error in the original languages. Well, if you spend your entire life saying that, and you look into this subject, then you end up backed into a very uncomfortable corner, uh, and you go down a very deep rabbit hole that I've not yet been able to get out of. (laughs) Well, it's time to take our next break. Listeners, we'll be back momentarily on the Truth Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the Truth Seekers radio show. Today, my guest is Rob Skiba. Rob, some people have in in Flat Earth community have been doing, um, conducting research experiments on their own. Have you done anything like that? Or, okay, could you tell Uh, us maybe some of the things you've found? Yeah, well, you know, after I finally came to terms with what the Bible actually says, and I couldn't get around it. I thought, okay, Lord, uh, what do I do with this? You know, some people would say, let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, I get that. But the Scripture also says to test all things or prove all things. So I thought, okay, Lord, you know, if somebody was to put a gun to my head right now and said, this is a matter of faith, not fact or science, what is your answer? If I have to make a decision based on faith alone, I'll say, okay, let the Bible be true and every man be a liar. But if I have more time and I don't have a gun to my head, then I'm going to proceed with what the Bible says and try to prove all things and test this and see if what the Bible says is, in fact, true. And, you know, to be fair, there have been plenty of um, atheists who started out that way. Josh McDowell and others who started out, you know, they didn't believe in God, so they ended up going on a quest to prove that the Bible is fraudulent and Jesus, you know, and all, all that stuff is not real. Well, they actually ended up converting and becoming Christians and wrote books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict, you know, or The Case for Christ, you know, uh, Strobel. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of consider myself on the same path as those gentlemen were when it came to, you know, they were trying to figure out, okay, is this Jesus stuff true? Well, in, the, in their quest to either debunk it or prove it, they ended up becoming converts. Well, in my quest to understand what the Bible has to say concerning the nature of the cosmos, specifically of our world, I'm still in the testing mode. And so I have been going out there and testing. In fact, I went out recently and bought a, uh, this camera that's unbelievable. It's the Nikon Coolfix P900. And if anybody wants to go buy this camera right now, uh, they'll probably have some difficulty doing so because they, every, at least when I tried to a few months ago, everywhere I went was sold out online or to stores. Nobody had it. Finally, I found a small camera dealership about an hour away from me uh, between Dallas and Fort Worth that happened to have a relationship with the Nikon, the, the head of marketing or whatever for Nikon as either a relative or something. Anyway, it was at his daughter's wedding. And so he was able to acquire, I think, six of them. And I happened to find him and bought one. And uh, the reason this camera is selling out so quickly is because all the flat earthers out there are buying it. <laughs> it, it that's just a fact. Um, I mean, I, I was at this Nebraska Furniture Mart. It's one of these uh, huge electronic and, you know, superstores. Got not just furniture, it's got everything. they got a big electronic section. And I went there, and they got a really expansive uh, camera section there. And I was just browsing to, to look at the other cameras, and the guy said, oh, are you, uh, do you have a camera yourself? I said, yeah, i got two of them. Oh, what do you have? I said, well, I have a Canon uh, 70D, and I also have the, the Nikon Coolpix P900. He goes, oh, man, we've been trying to get that forever, man. We just can't get it in stock. I mean, I don't know what the deal is, but I keep hearing people talk about it. I said, well, I can... I, I know why you can't get it. He goes, really? I says, yeah, but you're probably not going to like the answer. He goes, okay. I said, all the flat earthers are buying it up. He goes, what? I said, okay. I said, before I go any further, and I'll say this to your audience right now, mm-hmm. before I go any further and anything else we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. I, will, I said to him, do you know what cognitive dissonance is? And he goes, uh, I think so. I said, well, basically, it's we all think we know whatever we think we know. 
about a, pick a subject. And then when somebody comes along and challenges what we think we know, we have this knee-jerk reaction. You're crazy. You're stupid. You're insane. Get out of my face. You're an idiot, stupid moron. You know, we call people names that we have very negative reactions and sometimes violent reactions to people who challenge what we think we know to be true. I said, now that I have just described cognitive dissonance, are you ready to put it aside for a minute and allow me to engage with you in an intelligent conversation without calling me crazy? He said, uh, okay. I said, well, the store that um, I was at is not far from Lake Louisville. It's a large reservoir near my house. And now, if, if we are on a ball, what science will tell you is that the ball has a circumference of t- about 25,000 miles. 25,000 miles circumference. Well, the ball Earth mass tells you that the curvature, the detectable curvature on a ball of that size should be eight inches per mile per mile squared. It's not a slant. In other words, the second mile is not going to be 16 inches. It's going to be two times two times eight. Okay, It's eight inches times the mile squared. So uh, the second mile is 32 inches. The third mile is 72 inches. The fourth mile is 128 inches or 10 feet, 10.67 feet. Well, Lake Louisville has a long stretch that you can look across six miles, actually a little more than six miles. So what you should expect to see then at six miles is a, uh, a 24 foot drop. You know, anything that's 24 feet high or below that should not be visible from the observer at the other end. Now that's if basically at the, the, the ground level. Now, obviously, the, the math changes if you're on a tripod or if you're standing up, you know, the, depending on the height of your camera, you know, the math changes a little bit. But, you know, I, I set my camera up on, real low on the tripod, maybe 25 to 30 inches above the ground is what the tripod ended up being. Um, and I was seeing stuff that, according to the math, I should not be able to see. And there's another guy who's not a flat earther, he's just a photographer, who took a picture of the Chicago skyline from the other side of Lake Michigan, almost 60 miles away. Well, it's 60 miles away. The, the drop is almost a half a mile. In other words, the ground that he was standing on on the other side of Lake Michigan and the ground that Chicago is sitting on should be about a half a mile below the curvature of the Earth. The Sears Tower, the largest building over there, the top of the Sears Tower should be something like 900 feet below your ability to see it. And yet Joshua Nowicki snapped a picture of the Chicago skyline from almost 60 miles away. And he sent it to a, a local ABC News affiliate, and the weatherman did this unbelievable tap dance on the air. I'm not even convinced he believes what he's saying when you watch the clip, that what, what you're seeing is a mirage. And he even uses the word inversion. Well, a mirage does that. It inverts things, turns it upside down, creates a, you know wavy, distorted patterns. If you look at Joshua Nowicki's picture, it is perfect, perfect, perfectly straight up and down symmetrical building. It's not inverted. It's not wavy. It's not distorted. It's perfect. So what they all will say, well, it's refraction. The two key words that the, I'm calling them globalists or ballers, <laughs> or, you know, people who believe hardcore, full of cognitive dissonance, ball earth believers, well, well, they'll use two words, refraction and gravity, as their answer for everything. Well, oh, it's refraction. Ah, oh, it's gravity. It's bending light. I'm like, really? Um, I'm sorry. I just, I know what I'm seeing. And, and, and I would say to anybody out there who thinks that what I'm saying is completely absurd, fine, don't believe me. Go buy a Nikon Coolpix P900. If you can find one, they're about 600 bucks. This thing has an uh, 83 power optical zoom. Is you can magnify something about 83 times just with the optical zoom. And then it has a digital zoom on top of that, which effectively almost doubles it, which is about the equivalent of a between a 2 and 4,000 millimeter lens, a 2,000 millimeter lens and a 4,000 millimeter lens. And if you go to a camera shop and look at a lens like that, it's a huge thing that you'd have to add to your camera. Uh, and it's going to cost you, ten, you know, lots of money, thousands of dollars. So, Rob, when, little... when, when someone says that they've seen that curvature in when they're in an airplane, what would yeah. you say to someone when they say that? I would say, I said the same thing, first of all. I think everybody does. But the reality of it is, 
you just think you did. You've convinced yourself that you did because you believe you're on a ball. So when you look out the window, you think you're seeing the curvature of the earth because in your mind, well, I'm flying high up in the air. You know, commercial airline gets up to about 40,000 feet. So, you know, obviously, if I'm up 40,000 feet, I must be seeing the curvature of the earth. Well, you're not. Um, and those of you who think you are, get on a plane, take a camera. Now, you need a camera that does not have a fisheye lens on it because a, a wide angle or a fisheye lens is just what they call barrel distortion. It's going to bend the ends of your image um, depending on where where the horizon is uh, across the lens. If the horizon is above the center of the lens, you're going to get a ball. It's going to look like a ball. And you can do the same thing with a, with a just get a long straight edge pole or a rail. Look at a railing that's perfectly straight with the fisheye lens and uh, set, set the, uh, it, the, the object, the railing, above the center of your lens, and it will bend it. You know it's a straight bar, but it's going to look bent in your camera. If it's below the center of the lens, it'll be concave. It'll be bending the other way, so it'll look like a, a, a bowl. Um, but if it's across the center of the lens, even with a fisheye lens, it'll be pretty close to accurate, and it will be flat. And people have been sending up weather balloons to well over 100,000 feet. Again, commercial airlines only get to about 40,000 feet, 35 to 37 on average. Uh, but people are sending up weather balloons to well over 100,000 feet, and when that horizon goes across the center of the lens, it's flat. It's flat as a pancake flat. It's 130,000 feet. In fact, I've seen rocket footage shot, and I was in the 50s or 60s, I think, maybe even the 40s, I, I forget, but uh, rocket footage set uh, up on a V-2 rocket 65 miles high, and when that horizon goes across the center of the lens, flat. Uh, and the, I saw one that was sent up by some German uh, civilians, sent up uh, a rocket to 100, and I think it was 161 miles, if I remember right. I, I think it was last year or the year before. And same thing. Okay, so if rockets going up to 65 to over 100 miles high are returning images of flat horizons, you're not seeing a curved horizon on a 37,000 foot airline flight. And if you don't believe me, just go up there, take your iPhone, you know, uh, I've, and I've been on many flights since then. I'm, I do a lot of public speaking and I travel around a lot. And every time I go up there, if I get the opportunity to get a window seat, I'm looking out that window taking <laughs> pictures. And, and then when you bring it into Photoshop and put a parallel bar across it, flat as a pancake. It's time to take our next break. Listeners will be back momentarily on the Truth Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the Truth Seekers radio show. Today, my guest is Rob Skiba. Now, Rob, what about gravity? You brought gravity up earlier. That seems to be one of the um, arguments for the ball Earth model. What What do you say to gravity? Well, this is a uh, sort of a companion argument to the flat Earth argument, and that is geocentricity. And while I may be, uh, let's say, uh, a 1 is a hardcore globe earth believer and a 10 is a hardcore flat earth believer i'm an 8 okay i'm not i'm not all the way over there i'm an 8 um and there are several things that are keeping me from going on to a 10 and we can talk about those in a minute if you like um but those who believe in the ball uh tend to be for the most part heliocentric ballers you know they believe in the spinning ball going around the sun well, all of that's based on the Copernican model. And there's a movie out there called The Principle. And if you or your listeners haven't seen it yet, you need to watch it. Just go on, I think, theprincipalmovie.com. You can go to that website and stream it for uh, it's like 5 or $6, something like that. You can watch it on your computer. This movie shows secular and religious scientists proving that this place is not moving. It's not spinning, nor is it orbiting. If that's the case, then everything we think we understand about gravity goes out the window. Then everything we think we know is a lie. 
So we're basically having to scrap it all and start from scratch anyway. So, you know, for a lot of people, geocentricity is the gateway, if you will, to flat earth theory. Uh, because once you realize that the Copernican model is garbage and, you know, all that the heliocentricity is false, your whole world gets turned upside down anyway. And um, so you got to rethink everything. And at that point, it's not that big of a stretch to, especially if you're out there looking, trying to test the curvature, and you're seeing things you're not supposed to see. In fact, I was in Florida visiting my family uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I had several opportunities to go out to the beach and watch ships go out to sea. Now, one of the arguments everybody will say uh, is, well, we've all seen ships go over the curve of the Earth. Oh, really? Did you? Huh, go get a camera and check it out. Because uh, that's what I did. And it's right about the three-mile mark that you see a hard line in the water. And that's where you think, okay, that's the, that's the edge of the horizon. And so if it goes beyond that line, then, it, you know, if we're on a ball, then it's going to start to disappear a hole first. But when I watch the ships go out to that line and then continue past it, uh, I watched them go out to probably about four miles. And I was able to verify that on Google Earth. Uh, knowing where the, the fishing lanes are and where those ships go out to fish. Uh, they were going right out to about the four-mile mark, which is just about a mile beyond where the, the line of the horizon is. It looks like they float off into space, um, except that you can see, you can still see the water churning behind the motorboat, uh, and you can see the reflection of the ship on the water. And much past four miles, and then it does start to kind of get distorted into a mirage, then turns into a blob that you can't really recognize, and you know if it goes beyond that, the atmosphere, just, depending on the temperature and the you know, atmospheric conditions, it can disappear altogether. But it's not disappearing whole first. So you know, there you go. I mean, at this point, I'm like, well, what? And here's the other problem: if 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 you can hold on to the belief that ships disappear whole first because they're going over the curve of the Earth, then if you've got a you know, let's say a cruise ship or something, and it's disappearing, and let's say you lose. Uh, you know, 40 feet of the ship allegedly going over the curve. Well, that's about eight miles out. Uh, assuming you can watch the, that ship go out to about eight miles, then you're going to lose 40 feet of the ship. So depending on the size of the ship, that's a lot of it. It's, the, you know, it's either going to disappear altogether or you're going to see a great deal of that ship disappear. Okay, so if it went over the ball in less than eight miles, then in order to see that boat again, you would have to rise up on the y-axis. You're talking three dimensions. You know, x is side to side, and z is forward and back, and y is straight up. If you're going straight up on the y-axis, you would have to tilt your head or the camera down to look down the cur the ever curving ball to see the ship. The problem is, the more you rise up on that y-axis, the horizon keeps going up with you, which is absolutely impossible on a ball. Mm -hmm. You cannot get the horizon to rise up with you on a ball. If you lift up off a ball, you're going to rise up, but you'll be looking down on the ball, especially if you think ships are disappearing at, you know, in less than eight miles, going over the curve of the earth. You just think that through. Get a beach ball, get a little model of a ship, make the ship go over the beach ball, and then pretend you're the observer looking at it and you stand up. You're going to have to look down to see it, but that right. doesn't happen. You know, the horizon doesn't, you don't look down at the horizon. You, the horizon comes up with you. As high up to as 160 miles, it rises up with you. So, you know, that's, that's one of those things that has me hooked. I'm thinking, you know, I don't know what to do with that information. Now, why am I not a 10 on the flat earther then? Well, there's still issues with uh, southern flights that I may have maybe figured out. Um, not comfortable saying that I have. I'm still looking into it, but flights that go from like uh, Santiago to Sydney, you know, from South America to Australia, that Qantas Airlines goes, you know, allegedly under the ball of the earth to, to do that flight. That's one problem. The other is the problem of the 24 hour sun that is allegedly seen from Antarctica. Now, I say allegedly because I was recently contacted by somebody who lived on the southern tip of South America. You know, it's got that little point that comes down and curves, and that's just uh, north of the tip of Antarctica that kind of curves in the same direction. Well, this person lived right at the very tip of that curve of South America, and this person said, you know, they lived there for years, and they never saw a 24-hour sun, ever. Well, if you can't see it at that latitude, how could you see it further south? Because the sun only goes as far south as the Tropic of Capricorn. So... 
uh, you know, if you can't see it in the, at the tip of South, South America, you're certainly not going to see it in Antarctica. So then what are we looking at? If you know, this guy presumably has no dog in the hunt, you know, I don't know. I've got two conflicting stories. I've got two people that I don't know personally. Mm-hmm. One person is allegedly saying and shooting footage, supposedly, of a 24-hour sun going in a circle in Antarctica that I have no way to vet myself. And another person saying, hey, I used to live here and never saw it. And I have no way to vet it myself either, short of going to these places. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 50-50 at this point. But then I start finding NASA patents going all the way back to the 1960s of being able to patent and create an artificial sun. In the 1960s, they had a patent on how to create a fake sun. So, you know, if I'm to wear my tinfoil hat conspiracy theory, you know, uh, hat, then... And what it's would be plausible. the point of that? And if if they have a sun, what would stop them with just the sun? I, but I don't understand why they would even do that. Well, you know, that's the big question. What's the motive? And I wrote a, a whole blog on that, too. Uh, if you go to testingtheglobe.com and in the top menu, you see gearing up for Apollo. Second link down is examining an ancient motive. And I know we're going to run out of time here, so if I could just summarize it by saying... Right, because that was my... This is the biggest question or argument you get. Why would they lie to us? So that, yeah. Well, I'll give... Go ahead. I'll give you uh, uh, just five points off the top of my head. And I'll just go ahead and read it off the, the blog here. Uh, Genesis is the foundation of all that we believe in the Bible to be true. If Genesis is wrong, then it all crumbles under a faulty foundation. Genesis says nothing, zip, zero, nada, about the Earth being set in motion, orbital or rotational, around the Sun. In fact, the Sun doesn't even show up until after the Earth is already in place, with life already in existence. Genesis says the Sun, Moon, and stars were placed inside the same firmament within which the Earth was formed, not outside of it. Thus, we have a completely enclosed system within which the Sun, Moon, and stars move, not the Earth. Now, you can yoga, jujitsu, WrestleMania, twist, and distort the text in pretz- into pretzels all you want, but it won't change what it says. So, in the garden, the, the serpent started out with the premise, hath God really said? Uh, you know, I know that, you know, can't eat these trees, you know, this, that, and the other thing, right? But did God really say that? So, from day one, the serpent's agenda was to get us to question what God says. Well, I already said before, people can check it for themselves. From Genesis to Revelation, God says through his Holy Spirit-inspired authors that this place is a circular, still flat earth set of pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. So, Copernicus and company that followed, you know, Newton and later NASA and now Neil deGrasse Tyson and everybody else, is basically doing the same thing the serpent in the garden did. Really? Did God really say that? Nah, he didn't really mean that. That's number one. Two. If we are seeing, if what we are seeing concerning the flat, enclosed Earth thesis is true, then we are all there is. We are center stage. We are the main attraction, and there can be no argument as to whether or not there is a creator. None. His existence could not possibly become more blatantly obvious than in this model. I mean, if we're in a terrarium, that begs the question, who created this place? You know, it's the best argument for a creator, if ever there was one, as opposed to the ever-expanding universe, uh, when you have all these Neil deGrasse Tyson types, Carl Sagan, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, Richard Dawkins, all these guys making the case that we are nothing. We are insignificant. We are uh, the pale blue dot, insignificant pale blue dot in the backwater corner of a, you know, average galaxy, you know, in an ever-expanding universe. In other words, you are in- insignificant and you are nothing. You're a speck of dust in an ever-expanding cosmos. Well, if the biblical model is true, we're all there is. We're center stage. We're extremely important. <laughs> um, if the flat and closed Earth thesis is true, evolution goes out the window. Evolution is, is not even remotely plausible in the still flat and closed circular, you know, snow globe model. Only the ever expanding universe for over billions and billions of years makes that theory even remotely plausible. And then ancient aliens, forget it. You know, ev- evolution is bankrupt as it is. They, they acknowledge it, and that's why they're starting to promote panspermia, the idea that ancient aliens seeded this world with the necessary ingredients for Darwinian evolution to then take place afterwards, because they know that it could never do it, do it on its own. So basically, you have to have intelligent design, except that they're, they're going to deny that God, Yahuwah, yod heh is that intelligent designer, and they'll put it off on aliens. Well, evolution and aliens, that whole stuff, all of that is obliterated with the snow globe model. So uh, in this regard, I believe we've become painfully aware of the great deception 
and we will not be fooled by it. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that a, a big part of the Great Deception is going to involve the so-called uh, ancient alien idea. Well, you know, if this is true, and if this is the reason why this is coming out at this stage in human history, in the 21st century, for crying out loud, maybe all of this is out there to try to show us ahead of time that all that other stuff cannot even possibly be true. Number four, if the flat enclosed Earth thesis is true, then we cannot ever, ever trust NASA or the government about anything. And we will finally be forced to trust Yahuwah's word as our sole source for truth and stop trying to bend and manipulate it to fit false paradigms. And number five, if heliocentricity is false, then Scripture is true. If Scripture is true and can thus be taken literally, why should we not take it just as literal when it comes to the earth as being fixed, not moving, set on a foundation of pillars, carved as a circle with edges and borders inside something with four corners enclosed under a, door, a dome? And, you know, if, if we're going to say our Bible is our source for truth, then, you know, it's the whole package. So we can't ba- pick and choose what we're, what we're going to believe. with all those points, it was to hide God. I mean, that's, that's what exactly Mark what it was. Sargent made that point. It's, yeah, you could summarize all that long-winded answer <laughs> <laughs> with, with that, with that uh, brevity is not my strong point, uh, with that one <laughs> answer, yeah. Okay, Rob, can you give us uh, your, your website again? Uh, yeah, Testing the Globe. I had so much more to ask you, but we're out of time. And I'd like to have you back again to talk about your other books as well. But I got to say goodbye for today. Listeners, today my guest has been Rob Skiba. And thanks so much for taking time out of your day to listen on the Truth Seekers radio show. Until next week, God bless. (laughs) 